Um, so good, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, in this session, I'm going to be talking about um, giving an introduction to classification. Uh, my name is Martin Gordon Mubanjizi. I work with Pulse Lab Kampala and also I'm part of uh, the Artificial Intelligence Research Group at McKinney. So <coughs> classification is, is um, an important um, technique in machine learning and it's all about trying to make sense of the world and I'll try by giving an illustration of this before we go into uh, the applications and some of the algorithms that are used in classification. So, uh, making sense of the world. To a baby, everything is, is basically new. It is strange. Even the parents themselves, I don't know if some of you have kids, but even the parents themselves are strange, you know, because this is a new world. And there is a lot to make sense of. It is just the beginning. Um, things like chairs are in, come in different shapes, different color, different sizes, different textures. So basically everything is new uh, to the kid. But then, as the kid grows, the parents try to show or introduce these chairs to the kid. And the kid basically tries to, to learn to do categorization. And in a way, the kid later can make sense of the world by dividing things into the different categories. So let's look at how does the kid become good at identifying the chairs. The kid is going to be exposed to different types of objects that look like chairs, including the chairs themselves. The kid will take a record of these objects and their corresponding classes. Basically the chairs as the positive class and the other class that is not the chairs that we could say, what that we would call the negative class. Now, from this example, let's try to think about how we can teach the computer to, uh, to do classification. So we need to prepare a training set, and this training set must have both positive and negative class examples with their corresponding labels. So to do classification, we need, we need a training set. Then we also need an algorithm or a learning technique to basically train with the training set. Now, there are several algorithms. For example, the nearest neighbor, the k-nearest neighbor, neural networks, and decision trees, and then also support vector machine. So with the training set and an algorithm, the algorithm can be basically trained such that we end up with a classification model. Which classification model? You can give an object, a new object, and it will classify it. Now, I don't know if there are any questions, um, or I can just, you know, proceed. Any questions? Okay, um, let me proceed. So let's take a simple example 
where we have where we have two futures all attributes of different objects. So if we plotted these attributes, we would have something like this. But if we're given the classes, then we can have the class labels, then we can have um, the plot look like this whereby one class is red and the other class is, is blue. Now, if we got a new point, if we got a new point there, who can guess where this point would lie? Will it lie in the red class or it will lie in the blue class, depending on you know, the training set? which training set are the coordinates um, that give us points in red and blue and the corresponding classes. So which class is the new point? Are you sure? So how did you determine that it's red? Because it is? Because it is green. So it can turn to red. <laughs> yeah? Because it is? It is close to? It is close to red. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> when you train the model, when you train the model using this... Um, training set, it would, it can even separate the areas, meaning that if a point lies within this part, it will actually be, belong to the red class, and if it lies in this other part, it will be in the blue, in the blue class, okay? So by this, this is an illustration that you need a training set, and the training set should have both the positive and the negative class. And then you need an algorithm to train the model such that when you have a new point, it's able to know where to, uh, which class to place it. So some of you talked, I mean, um, you, the answer was that that point will be in the red class and the reason you gave was that because that point is close to uh, is close to the points in the red class. So now, so basically, there is um, this nearest neighbor uh, algorithm, and using that here, it would check. Uh, it would try to calculate the the distance between this point and points in both classes, and then it would, uh, this point would then eventually take on the color of the class um, that, of the, of, the, of the point that is close, that has the shortest distance, okay, in all the points. So this one would end up uh, being um, given the red color. <coughs> Now let's look at um, evaluation matrices uh, that can be used when we are looking at, at classification. So we have said that we have the positive class and the negative class. And so when you are, which, and, and when you do the prediction, when you do the prediction, you basically are predicting a class of the new uh, object that has been introduced. In the other case, we had a point. And um, as Neil said in the morning, you normally keep part of your data to be the training set, and then part of the data to be the testing, uh, the testing set or uh, the validation set. 
such that after the prediction, you, know, you actually know what the actual class was, okay? So you can come up with something like this. So in this confusion matrix, we, um, we can have a total, we can have a total of the number of objects that were positive and were predicted as positive. So those are the true positives. You also have those that were positive but we are predicted as negative. So those are the false negatives. You have those that were negative but were predicted as positive. Those are the false positives. And then you have those that were negative and were actually predicted as negative. And those are the true negatives. So you have um, a confusion uh, matrix like this. Let's just um, consider the case that we had of a child trying to identify chairs. Imagine the child, imagine we had in our testing set, we had 102. And of those 102, we had 57 positives. So the kid was able to correctly identify 50, 50 chairs and was thought that the, the seven were not chairs when they were actually chairs. So the total chairs that we had in this set was 57. Then also imagine that also imagine that there were 37 there were 37 chairs that the kid could correctly uh, could correctly identify. Okay, so this would give us the confusion matrix. Basically how well the kid can identify true class, negative class, and then where the misclassification was. Then also continuing um, to look at how we evaluate the, uh, the classification models, we also have sensitivity. And sensitivity is the true positive rate, and you get that by taking the true, the true positives divided by all the positives, so which was basically 50 divided by uh, the total, which was 57. Um, specific, specificity is actually, um, this is supposed to be true negative divided by all negative. So this is a result of copy and paste. Um, and changing, you know, being lazy in typing. Um, then we have accuracy, which is the recognition rate, where you just get the true positive plus the true negative, and then you divide by the total. And then we also have the error rate, where it is one minus accuracy, all false, false positives plus false negatives divide by the total, okay? So this would help you to evaluate your model, okay? To know how well it's doing. Uh, any questions? Yes. Hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, there are several. There are several guidelines, and I think I'll ask Anis to answer that question later, because he has done a lot of, you know, classifications on this. Um, so he will be in position to advise us um, what algorithms hmm, to use. Um, then let's look at real life. 
applications where classification is actually used. Um, I think most of us have email accounts or email addresses, and we know that there is, you know, the spam filter. Okay, we know that there's spam filter, and we know that sometimes some emails are marked as spam while they are not. And we know that sometimes some emails are not marked as spam while they are, they are spam. So who could tell us, you know, what the spam filter considers, what features in an email will the spam filter use to filter out that this is spam, this is not spam? Or what features in an email would you consider to mark an email spam? Or just to leave it in your inbox? Uh, yes. Vocabularies. Vocabularies? Tabs? Can you give more information about what your... Like shopping, uh huh. Win prizes, Win prizes. Mm -hmm. and, so many and so many others. Good. Yes. The sender, yeah. So also the email address of the sender. What else? What else? What else do you use? Yes, Silas. The frequency at which you get the messages can also imply that it is spam. Yes. Oh, the messages. Okay. Okay. So, what other users, whether they have marked the, those, such emails as spam or not? Good. What else? Yes. Patterns, signatures, etc. Okay. Anything else? So as as we mark emails, as we mark emails as spam, what we're actually doing, we are providing we are adding to the training set. Okay? We're adding to the training set. Okay. Let's now uh, try to look at um, the automatic disease diagnosis. Uh, this is a project um, uh, that John is working on and other members in uh, the Artificial Intelligence Lab at Makerere University. And in this, um, in this, Basically, what you see here is a microphone that is fitted on the eyepiece of uh, a microscope. And um, a blood smear that is stained is actually put under, is put on the microscopic table. And so from, uh, from the phone, you can be able to see what is on the slide, okay? Um, so in this, in this, it's, this is a type of classification. This is a type of classification where um, even a person who is not an expert can be able to use this. So the phone has a software tool that, is a class, that has a classifier that can basically identify malaria parasites, okay? So later on, we're going to see how it is actually done, okay? So this is an application of classification. The other one is the automatic uh, counting and also identification of the type of roof. So this application can automatically identify 
from a satellite imagery whether a particular type of roof is grass searched or it is actually a metal. Okay, and this is useful because the type of roof is a proxy for poverty. Now, we also know that the census in which such information is collected takes like a period of 10, 10 years. So it means you have to wait for a period of 10 years to notice any changes in poverty. So this tool um, was developed by Pulse Lab Kampala and it has actually got more applications including counting the temporary settlements in a refugee um, settlement. Okay? Counting the temporary structures in refugee settlement and uh, <clears throat> and so if this is satellite imagery then you can have you know this tool automatically identify um, these types of roof and it can also count them okay it can also give you a count so this is more to that and this is also important because in some parts of Uganda, if the income levels of a household improves, people change from the grass searched to a metal roof. Okay? So that's why this is very important. Yeah, I don't know whether it is the same in Tanzania, but <laughs> some people are laughing. Yeah, yeah but uh, it's, um, yeah. Uh, the other application is. Um, an application that, um, you know, Ernest and uh, the other group, uh, the other members of the artificial intelligence lab at Makrede are working on. And this is basically counting uh, white flies. So these white flies transmit disease from one crop to another, and this crop in particular is called cassava. And um, what normally happens is that uh, experienced um, agriculturalists move to the field and make surveys, you know, like every year. But because they have to go to, to gardens, turn the leaves, and then start counting the white flies, which is basically tiresome. And as the leaves are turned, these white flies also do fly. So if there were like a hundred on a leaf, by the time this expert turns the leaf to count the white flies, some of them has, have actually flown from the leaf. And uh, so what the group, the MCROPS group at, uh, in the artificial intelligence lab did was to come up with a classifier that can work on a phone such that now the expert can just turn the leaf, take a photo, and as the photo is taken, the white, the, the white flies are, are identified okay, on the leaves and a count of, you know, a count of the white flies is immediately um, shown. And this can be sent directly to the servers and in real time, a map showing, where, uh, showing locations where these white flies are, you know, can be plotted. So this is another example of um, white flies. So uh, Ernest is around. Uh, those who want to know more of how that was done and other MCROPS members, they can explain in detail. But this is another application of a classification. Now let's try to look at um, uh, the automatic um, diagnosis. Now I must say um, when I was coming up with this I looked at uh, what uh, John had prepared, Ernest had prepared and put it together. Okay, Such that um, I did not do a lot of uh, 
work. So the automatic uh, diagnosis, um, so imagine, so what we're, what we're seeing uh, in a microscope was something like this, and uh, some of these, some of these things that we see here are basically the, um, are the, the organisms that cause malaria. But then these are other parts of the blood. And so what normally happens is that the person looking through the microscope has to take different slide views of what is on the slides and he has to count the parasites. So you can see these are now the, the parasites and this is something else. And so the expert in the lab after taking a sample from a patient he has to stain it and he has to, ha to basically take different slide views and he has to count the number of parasites in the blood. Because in the end, he has to know whether the malaria was in its initial stages or whether the malaria was in its advanced stages. And that will help him determine the type of medication to give you. I think most of us are familiar with malaria, uh, so we know what happens. But of course, this is tiresome. Imagine if the expert has to look through the microscope, I mean, has to, uh, has like a hundred patients, has a hundred patients to basically examine. So that means that he has to look at different slide, slide views for each of the, uh, of the patient. So if there are like 20 slide views that he's supposed to look at for every patient, it means if there are 100, it is 20 times times 100. So it's also tiring. And also the experts that understand, that can identify these parasites are also few. So this can actually be used to help um, in those areas where these experts are not. Or even the, if an expert is actually using this, it would make his work easier. So this is classification. So So what would happen is that that kind of data would be split into small grids and then for each of the grids, for each of the grids, the classification would try to see whether there is a parasite or not. So what, what um, happened was that an expert, again, was asked to annotate. So in the annotation, the expert was able to identify locations that all patches that basically had the parasite. And then the expert generated examples of the positive class then also went ahead to generate examples of the negative class, okay? Such that now with a new patch, the system having used examples of the positive class and the negative class, the system would be able to classify. But let's try to understand how you would move from this to actually uh, coming up with a classification model to actually do the classification. So what we had here are basically images. But these images can be transformed 
into a vector. Okay? So if this is a grayscale image, and these are the pixels of the grayscale image, then we can get this part and create a vector. We get this, we add it to the vector, and then we get these values, we add them to the vector. So we get something like this. Okay? So now we have one dimensional vector representing representing um, an image. So if this image was a three by three, then the vector will will be will have will be uh, if it was a three by three, then we come up with uh, with a nine by one vector, okay? So how do we proceed from here? Let's just use a simple example of digits. Imagine we had data of these um, digits, and maybe I have to say that uh, if you are looking, you are reading a book, you are actually doing a lot of classification, okay? Or if you are reading a letter, you know, you try to identify what the person was trying to, to write. So in a way, you are doing a classification. But we, we human beings are now good at it, so you don't even notice. Uh, but if you're presented with something like this, if one's handwriting was like this, you can actually see that this resembles a one and this resembles a two. But the computer does not look at it like this, okay? So we need to train it such that it can be able to identify and understand people's handwritings of digits. Now, if we just use, uh, if this is our training set, and we get this new input. Then what we can do, we can change this to, to the actual values. Okay, to the actual values. So that means uh, this is a five by this is a five by five, okay? So that means we break up this into uh, those pixels and then we are able to pick the values. So if I may ask how could you, how do you think you could decide which one is the best match? Because now you're not looking, you're not looking at this, but you are looking at at this. Any suggestions on how we can identify which one best matches our test, um, our test data? Any ideas? Any ideas? Yes. Ah, so there are big numbers here. Okay. So, okay, that's a good answer. Any other suggestion? So basically what you're saying that we should just compare numbers in this, in this column. Yes, Mike. We can add them up. So Mike is saying that we can add these and compare them with what we have added here, okay? So Mike, then what would you do finally? I mean, this is, um, 
the computer algorithm that you, you have written, it, it, is, it can add up this and that. So how do you do that? What do you, how do you test that these are the same? Okay. So you expect two to add up to a bigger number than one. But what would that number be? Would it be a fixed number or it would be in a particular range? Yeah, you're right. So that's where you need to get training data. Uh-huh. Pick a number between the two. Pick a number between between the two. Okay? Yes? The, the distance, the distance. Okay, how how would we do that? Square root. Okay. Uh huh. Any other suggestion? Any other suggestion on how we we'll do this? Okay, uh, let's, let's um, look at this. So someone is suggesting distance, okay? And um, basically, we could use a similarity all distance measure, and the most common one is this kind of measure, which, you know, um, can give us the distance, can give us the distance between each of the points, okay? But remember, in the image, we are having more than, we are having more than uh, one. So in this, this would be used, useful when you have two futures, okay? You have two numbers. But remember, the other, uh, in the other, in what we're looking at, we're having a five by five, okay? So that means we need to get the distance between each of, each of the numbers. So if we do that, so basically we can have any dimension. We can do it with any dimension. And so we can then translate this into an algorithm and this algorithm is the nearest neighbor uh, classification algorithm. And in this, we take the training examples where x is are the attributes or are the other values. So each of the x, each of the x will be, so it was a five by five, so it will be a one by, uh, it will be a 25 by one um, column vector. And then for each of the column vectors, we shall have the class or the label. Um, so what we want to do is take a test point, X star, and be able to come up with its class. So for that, we can calculate the distance between this new point and then we find xi for which the distance was the smallest and then our new class will actually be the class of uh, the point x, xj which in that case will be the class, the corresponding class y, j, okay? So basically that is um, the algorithm that we would have to, um, to, to use if we're talking about the distance. So this marks um, the end of, um, of um, the presentation on classification.
I'm going to wait for some questions. Um, Ernest, may you answer one of the, the first questions that were asked? How do you choose which classification to use? Sometimes some people have some anecdotal sort of experience with which works best, which things have worked best somewhere else. Um, yeah, but generally you have to sort of try these algorithms. Uh, sometimes some data may work best with certain algorithms, but again, you know, this is that's why you have to train to go through the processes. It's not straightforward. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? You know, I have a lot of experts in the, in the room, so you ask questions, I, I answer them, or I direct them to the experts. Any other question? Any other questions on classification? Do you want to know more about the white fly classification? Or... Um, the disease diagnosis? Yes. In the case of the white flies? Which algorithms? Honest. They not here. Um, could you please repeat that? I think uh, I did not hear that. I think, Anis, you have to help because. Uh, How okay. is the name of the person? Ah, okay. okay. So how does how does it work? I mean. Okay. Um, Paul Viola is the vice president of science for Primair now. Wow. From that algorithm. So you see, you start with a high wavelet and then you do Primair. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other question? Yes. Still on the white flies. Mm. Um, so the question, Ernest, is how do you ensure the accuracy given the number of white flies you have collected? I mean, accuracy, I think. Right, so the white fly thing is uh, uh, it's a bit of a tricky thing. So the accuracy is, uh, is done for testing. So you have to get the image and then you 
you have to manually take for the white friends, so you have to know where all the white friends are. So this is what we do in practice. And then you train this algorithm for which I don't have to be using. I'm using John, which is also trained with the neural networks. And then once it gives you a, an output, and then you sort of have to compare the place it says uh, there was white light, where it actually detected white light. And the place is where it says there's white light, there's no white light. So you have to do this sort of confusion matrix that matching uh, theory. Uh, and so in, in practice, what you do is try to pass this first file. So you can have a, an algorithm that identifies more white lights than the other did, or you can have a, an algorithm that identifies fewer white lights than the other did. And so one idea is to sort of try and balance this thing to either one decides. Uh, so in practice, what happens is that uh, the farmers, the people build this up for, uh, sometimes they are, they are more interested in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the market for the white plants. So these white plants can be made, they can be created and made for white plants. So, you know, for the person to count, so if you make an error and you get 315, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a big error, for example, for them. But if they are five white flies and you get an error of three instead of five, then this is, this is uh, you know, this is something of concern to them. But generally, when they're doing the analysis, they, they, the, the numbers sort of give them an idea of how many white flies there are. So if they're more than 300, then they they're more than 100, then it's too much. If there's you know, less than 5, less than 7, less than 10, then they also know this is you know, uh, fairly okay. So they use these aggregate numbers. So what they do, they count white flies different leaves on a plant, and then they aggregate that over the whole garden, and then based on this count, they can sort of predict you know, whether there's going to be a spread of disease, whether it varies uh, of cassava that is correct or not, is a good variety of not very susceptible to white plants. So this is what they use this house for. Yeah. But yeah. the process of making sure that aggregate is really a process of retraining and training again, and sort of scoring them again, and visually looking at them. Right? Because you cannot run an algorithm and just say that there are 10 true white plants, and the algorithm has come up with. 10 uh, white lines counted. This is not enough. You sort of have to look at the image and see whether the 10 things got are uh, the 10 which are actually white lines. So it's a, it's a bit of a process where you have to sort of look at each image score to understand. But you can do this, of course, uh, automatically. So, Anis, do you have the application for people to try out? I mean, yeah, you can download it online. You can now download it from the uh, and it would be interesting if we can have some some data flowing in from Tanzania <laughs> on white flies. Oh, yes. Okay, so <laughs> if it is, yeah. Uh, so any other any other question? Yes. Hello. 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 On there. Which classification? Ah, uh -huh, the satellite image yeah. imagery. Okay, um, I'll I'll ask John to. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's that there is what. Okay.
I think um, uh, you know when you need something which is very specific to your own problem, then that's when you have to start using these these kind of techniques here, and you can't just buy something off the shelf. You have to uh, you have to start working on something. So that's the reason that we had to build from scratch. Mm. And of course, as I said, <coughs> um, once that was um, developed, we also got other applications for that. Okay, and because Pulse Lab is part of the UN, you know, we are able to we are able now to work with uh, refugee agencies in helping them be able to count the temporary settlements that they have put up, you know, in the refugee. Uh, the refugee settlements. So basically that's the other benefit. And we don't have to to pay some money, but we come up with something that we have that is open source that is also customized to, for a particular purpose. So that is the advantage. So I yes. Yeah, I mean, that was just a simple example to illustrate. Um, sorry. To illustrate, to illustrate uh, classification. So, imagine you have an object that could be, that, that uh, has to that has two attributes, all properties, okay? Which attributes are enough eh, to either classify it as in the red class or in the blue class, okay? So, meaning that if you get a new, a new object, you would just look at, you just look for those attributes and then you would, uh, determine, use that to determine which class it lies. So this is just a toy example for, just to explain that you need a training set of both positive and negative classes, okay? And then when you get a new point, you just use those futures to determine where, you know, the new point lies, or the new object lies, which class it lies. I don't know whether I've answered that. The one? Who? Ah, sorry. Oh, this year. Ah, the one and two. You're saying this? Yes. Yes, so basically this was just an example to still, uh, such that we can think of an algorithm that we can use for a classification, okay? And um, in the exercise that we're going to have, maybe, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's going to start now, or after, we are going to work with this data of digits, okay, and with class, different classifiers, and we shall see how classification can be done with the digits. And uh, as I said, I normally make my, my life, um, I normally make my life um, simple. And so I actually used what Mike had uh, prepared for the exercise that we're going to have. Okay, but it's going to be about digits. There are going to be 10 digits, zero to nine, okay? And then uh, these digits are going to, we're going to have their vectors and then the corresponding classes. And then these classifiers would be able to classify um, basically new inputs. Yeah? Um, so I think that will become very clear when, uh, when we go for the exercise. Any other question? So my question is, uh, these digits, the, the images are current 
working class. Yes. So I'm curious on how this would be done if uh, there were there were the heavy demand for cars. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a colored image has um, I think three bands one for red, blue, and green. Or it could be uh, you know there are different formats. Okay? So that means for each layer so that means that um, so if if we have a pixel that has a particular color, okay, because we know when you mix, if if you mix colors at different uh, levels, if we had red, blue, green. So we have a, say we have a scale from 0 to 255 for each of these. So if this is color red, we know that we have this as 255 and blue and green are at zero. Okay? So that means if we have a particular pixel of a particular um, of a particular color, say um, when you mix um, when you mix when you mix red and uh, and blue, what color do you get? Red and green, okay. Red and green is is yellow. Okay? So that means if you have a yellow pixel, it will be 255. You'll have 255 for red. You'll have zero. Now it's normally written as RGB, okay? So you have 255, 255, and then zero, okay? So you still have these values. Now if the digit is an eight by by eight, okay? It means you have three of these, okay? And if you wanted to start with red, you can start with 64 for that layer, another 64 for the other layer, another 64 for another layer. So you still can, you know, um, come up with uh, with that. But I think with the digits, maybe it's good to use uh, grayscale. Okay? Any other question? So if there are no questions, then maybe you can clap for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let, um, maybe someone should tell us whether we are having a break or we should continue. There's a break. Say so break for tea and then we shall come back and uh, do the exercise. Thank you. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, thank you.